everything I missed. I'm excited as the work he has committed into our trust. And this very hour, we'll be praying. We will be praying and seeking the face of Jehovah. We'll ask him to, be, to visit us this very hour. We need a visitation of the Almighty in our midst. Like no other time do we need that mighty visitation of Jehovah upon our life as a ministry. Let's open our mouths right now, being a cry out to Jehovah. Father, this season we are asking for divine, divine visitation of your glory, divine visitation of your touch. We have gathered together again to seek your face and to honor you today. Jehovah, we are trusting and believing that today will be a very unique time, a time to, to experience that mighty power of the Holy Ghost in our midst. Our hearts and minds are open, Jehovah. We are desperate for you. We deeply need you. We underscore our basic and fundamental need for you. You are more important than the air in our lungs. You are, you, 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 your loving kindness, Jehovah, is more precious than life. Father, Jehovah, we are thanking you because that we are alive today is by your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your protection, your immense protection over our lives, your immense provision, your sustenance, your provision, your protection, your covering. Thank you, Father, for, for safety in our going out and coming in. Thank you, Father, for choosing us as the elect ones. Thank you, Father. The word said before you found us in our, in our mother's womb, you knew us. Before we were formed in our mother's womb, you knew us. You ordained us as prophet to the nations. And today we are thanking you for the great and mighty call you have placed upon our lives. We are thanking you because we are standing in gap today. We have been commissioned by the Holy Spirit, by the rock, to preach the good news of the kingdom of Jehovah. We are thanking you for the power of the Holy Spirit that attains to our words. We are thanking you for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. We are thanking you for the strength and the boldness that the Spirit provides for us. We're thanking you for the enabling, the supernatural support and the supernatural partnership of the Holy Spirit among us in our midst today. We're thanking you, sweet, precious Holy Spirit. We underscore our desperate need for the divine power of your anointing, Holy Spirit. We know that words alone are not sufficient to convict the heart of men and to bring them to repentance that we desperately need the anointing the fellowship of the spirit to accomplish the work we've been commissioned by the spirit of god Jehovah, we're thanking you because your words are before we, before we are formed them in our mother's womb you knew us that your plans for us are the plans of good not of evil to give to us a future and a hope we we'll thank you because that you created us in Messiah unto good works, which you prepared in advance for us to walk in. We well, thank you because we are coming into realization of the good works that you have in store for us, that we are your masterpiece, and we are living as men and women who are actually your masterpiece. The Bible says we are your good, you, where your hand works. We are your poema, your act, your work of art. Created a Messiah Yeshua to, for good works. We're well, thanking you for the empowerment we are receiving through your word. That your word is nourishing. We are being nourished by your word. We are being satisfied by your word. We are being empowered by your word. We are being transformed by your word. We are gaining wisdom, direction, and encouragement by your word, Father. Thanking you because we are regaining and understanding the preciousness of your word. That faith comes by hearing your word. And, by, and hearing comes by faith. That faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of Jehovah. We are receiving your word, Jehovah, from how from infancy we have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make us wise unto salvation through faith in Yeshua Messiah. We're thanking you, Father, for the things your word is doing in us. That your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. 
penetrating or the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, is a sign of the intent of the heart that nothing in all creation is hidden from Elohim's sight. But all things lay bare before him to whom we have to give account. We thank you for our partners, our friends, our members around the world, wherever they may be. We thank you for their protection, their provision, their advancement. That none will backslide, that none will go back, that none will be weary, that none will be sick, none will die untimely. We thank you, but your word says that none will cast their young. The full length of our days we will fulfill. We pray the fulfillment of days for every member of this ministry, for house of Israel worldwide, for the fulfillment of our days on earth today. We thank you, Father, once again. That as House of Israel ministry, we are advancing in boldness. We are, we are effecting change in the nations. You are granting us platforms and influence to impact lives. That every hindrance and limitations are removed from our path and our way. We thank you also, Holy Spirit, because you are moving upon us, both to will and to do of your good works, your good pleasure. We thank you, Father, for the immense blessings upon this ministry, upon our radio ministry, upon our internet ministry, upon the dimensions or areas of ministry where you've called us to move into. We're thanking you, dearest Holy Spirit. Thank you for the radio ministry, for the impact. You've called us unto impact. You've called us to make a difference. You've called us to be the difference. You've called us to be the miracle. Help us embrace and walk in who we are. Let fear not hold, let fear not hold us back. Let unbelief not hold us back. Let doubt not hold us back in this crucial time. We we'll pray you bring us out of all forms of busyness. Busy doing nothing. Busy going around circles. Busy walking away from our calling. We pray that we will be attentive, we will be listening, we will be receptive to the impulse, the knowledge of the sweet, precious rock that the Holy Spirit will again redirect our footsteps in every way we've missed our paths. We come against all forms of oppressions of Satan, demonic oppression, hindrance, limitation, backwardness, failure, infirmity, spirit of deafness and blindness, hindering spirits. We come against the assignment against our homes, against our partners, against this ministry worldwide. We come against their works and operations in the life of our members. We we'll pray again for today's service that you, mighty Holy Spirit, will move in our midst, that there will be signs and wonders, the release of signs, wonders and miracles, that you stretch forth their hands to heal, and the signs and wonders will be wrought at the name of your Son, Yeshua Messiah. No one who comes here oppressed will go back oppressed. Let chains be broken. Let yokes be broken. Let the oppressed be set free. Let the prison doors be burst open. Let today be a day of deliverance, a day of freedom, the Sabbath of freedom. The Sabbath of miracles and signs and wonders and marvelous works of the Spirit in our midst. Oh, once again, we pray for perfect hearts. A heart be perfect towards you. A heart be single towards you. That a heart will not be like the wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. That our heart be single. We pray again for a listening ear, ears that listen to the tone, the voice, the music of heaven, the sound of God. The heart and minds will be focused on things above where Messiah is seated at the right hand of Elohim. We're praying that every form of confusion, depression, disillusionment, oppression, harassment, obsession of all forms, be broken of the lives of your people. The Bible says where there is all forms of confusion and strife, there you find all evil works. We come against all strife, all contention. We come against the works of the flesh, sorcery, witchcraft, hatred, envy, bitterness, resentment, 
drunkenness, sexual immorality. We pray that we will ascend free from this hold of the flesh that your people will live in the ascended life of the Spirit of God. We're praying again for truth, that we will be people who walk in the truth of God. We're praying that your word will find reflection in us today. We pray that we will not be carried away by all forms of strange doctrines, but our heart be established in grace. We're praying again for revelation. 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 We will not be blinded. We will be attentive to the revelation, the apocalypse of the Spirit of God. We pray for dedication and devotion that we will increase our devotion to Jehovah and His word and His commandment. We will not be lopsided. We will not be wishy-washy, weak, lethargic, lazy, slumbering, and then wasting our lives. We will be diligent in the things of God. We pray for deep desperation for the word of God that we will pursue the study of your word the same way a thirsty man pursues water and your word will become bread to our hungry soul. Many have neglected the place of the study of your word. Many have become so burdened and weak and tired by the weight of the burdens of life that they can no longer Eat of the bread of your word. We we'll come against all forms of worldliness. Worldliness. We we'll pray you will cause us to walk in godliness. That will become more like God in everything. His nature, his character, his attitude, his vision, his mission will be so ingrained in our consciousness and our subconsciousness. We want to change. We want Messiah to be formed in us. We want to be men and women of a difference. For you have called us out of the world. Help us live as distinct, the called out ones, the set apart ones. Oh, free us from all entanglement of traditions, of victimization, of unbelief, of incompetence, of idolatry. Grant us boldness today. To stand for the truth, to live the truth of God's word. Help us not be here and there. Help us be firm in our conviction. Help us live out the things we believe. And we have become assured of today. We we'll pray that today the heart and minds of men be open to hear the message. We come against the spirit of binding and silent, destruction, deception. The enemy to entice and seduce the minds of people of the word of God. We we'll pray for the ears that we hear and the eyes that we see today we will not remain the same again. In Yeshua's mighty name we we'll pray. Hallelujah. First Kings 15. First Kings 15. We'll be praying, we'll be praying using First Kings 15. We'll be looking at the life of this mighty man of God in 1 Kings chapter 15. 1 Kings chapter 15. Now in the 18th year of the reign of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, Abijah became king of Judah and he reigned in Jerusalem three years. His mother was Maka, daughter of Absalom. Verse 3. He committed, he committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to Jehovah, his Elohim. As, as the heart of David, his forefather, had been. Verse 4. Nevertheless, for David's sake, Jehovah his Elohim gave him a lamb in Jerusalem by raising up a son to succeed him and by making Jer Jerusalem strong. For David had done what was right in the eyes of Jehovah and had not failed to keep any of, the, any of Jehovah's commands all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Verse 6. 
there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam throughout Abijah's lifetime. As for the other event of Abijah, Abijah's reign, and all he did, are they not all written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? There was war between Abijah and Jer Jeroboam, verse 8. And Abijah rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. And Asa, his son, succeeded him as king. Verse 9. In the twentieth year, year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king of Judah. And he reigned in Jerusalem forty years, forty-one years. His grandmother's name was Maka, daughter of Ab Abishalom. Now mark that word there. His grandmother's name was Maka, daughter of Abishalom. Verse 11. Asa did what was right in the eyes of Jehovah, as his father David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother, Maka, from her position as queen mother because she made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down and burned it in Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to Jehovah all his life. He brought into the temple of Jehovah the silver and gold and the article that he and his father had dedicated. Verse 16. There was war between Asa and Bashar, king of... No, let's, let, let me not go there. So let me just pause for a while and then let's run to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 15. Second Chronicles 15. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now let's look at... We're looking at the story of Asha, Asa. His father had embraced idolatry. Even his grandmother, Maka, had brought in idols. So Asa did not have an example. Like his, his father did not work with God with a perfect heart. But when Asa came as king, it was not his father that influenced him or his grandmother because the father did not serve God. The grandmother was into idolatry. Now this young man comes as king. He does not go the way of his father. or He even removed his grandmother as being queen mother. And he removed all the idols she has erected. Asa began to seek the Elohim of his father David. Sometimes you don't need a direct influence to serve God. You can, it may be somebody, you know, before your generation. It could be, you know, we just need to understand the life of Asa. Asa did not have a direct influence. Those around Asa, King Asa, were living the life of idolatry. But Asa came in and made a difference. Why? Because if you look at the, at the book of Kings... There's one word you find that is particular, and that word pertains to our life today. Doing what is right in the eyes of Jehovah, or serving Jehovah with a perfect heart. The challenge with the kings, as we see them in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and Chronicles, is that most of the kings did not have a perfect heart towards God. And that's where we are many times. Many don't have a perfect heart towards Jehovah. You need to check your heart to discover, is my heart perfect towards Jehovah? Many times you see a generation, four generation, of these four generations, no one has a perfect heart towards God. And the fifth generation, somebody emerges and has this appetite for God, whereas four generations before them did not serve God. If a man emerges, just like Asa, 
emerged in an era where the grandmother was an idol, idol, idolator. She was into idolatry. The father had built all forms of systems of idolatry. So Asa was born in that system, yet the idols did not affect him. He pulled, he got rid of all the idols the father, the grandmother had brought in. He disposed them all. What made Asa unique? Asa's heart was perfect towards Jehovah. Is your heart perfect towards Jehovah? He compares that those whose hearts are perfect will follow the example of David. That this man used David as a role model for righteousness. That if, they, if the kings did what was right in the eyes of Jehovah, they were borrowing from the pattern of David. You see, the sad thing with many of us is that we don't even know, we don't know where we belong. We, there is no deep sense of... Oh. Many are so concerned with their situation, their problems, their life. And all God asks from you is that, is your heart perfect towards me? How can a man's heart become perfect towards Jehovah? What does it mean for a man's heart to be perfect towards God? Your heart is perfect towards God when your desire and your ambition and your goal is to do His command and His will. You may have Everything in your life unorganized, things may not be the way they should be. Your life may, be, may appear miserable at the moment. But if you have an ambition, a hunger to obey his command, to do his will, he has a way of setting things back in the order. If your intention deep within your heart, not the, I mean intention, not deception, because many think they want to serve God, but the way they live their life shows they don't want to serve God. If your heart is perfect towards Jehovah, your heart will bleed that sin. <laughs> you will just find yourself different because this perfect heart is a heart drawn to his commandment. It's a heart drawn to the things of God. Just like David, God said to Samuel, I have found a man after my heart who will do the things I want him to do. David was such a man who loved God. He was a shepherd boy. Nobody knew him. He was there in the back desert. No one knew him as a sheep tenderer. But there in his heart was, was a, a hunger for God, a hunger for his law. That God will have to orchestrate the veins that will bring David out of obscurity and make him king. That when it comes to exhortation, the Bible says exhortation does not come from the east or the west, but God is a judge. That if where you are, it could be in the desert or in a, in a hole or in a valley, but right in that situation, if your heart is perfect towards Jehovah, he will have a way to organize events to bring you into greatness. Like Joseph, he was sold as slave into Egypt. Potiphar bought him. Potiphar's wife lied that he wanted to rape her. Joseph is thrown into prison. Now look at the interaction between Joseph and Potiphar's wife. He tells this woman, All my master owns is in owns. I am authority, but not you. How many young believers? How many so-called prayer warriors? How many so-called church members would face a woman such like Potiphar's wife and have this grip in your heart and tell this woman, everything my master has is in my authority but not you. Joseph had a platform at that moment to increase, you know, to increase his chances for freedom, to begin to sleep with the master's wife and then, you know. (laughs) 
the things many of us do in secret shows our heart is not perfect towards God. When your heart is not perfect towards God, God cannot be pleased with you. He can't. We don't look at circumstances to say, yes, the reason why I did this was because, you know, there was no body. No, Joseph had no body. He was sold as slave. He was back, you know. He was hurt by his brothers. Brothers, He could have took that reason to now become, oh, that's, that's how life goes. Life is that way. You backstab people. My umbra backstabbed me, so that's how I think now. It's about being fast. I don't care. I'm going to take what belongs to Potiphar. But Joseph had the idea that to walk into divine greatness, the heart must be perfect towards God. No, there's no way out. The heart must be perfect towards God. You know, it's a sense of, will my actions glorify God? A sense of, will God be pleased by this action? Not how I feel, but will God be pleased at this action? Many people's hearts are not perfect towards God. They don't even care about how God sees their action. So 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Chronicles show us that kings who pleased God, who did what was, right, what was right in the eyes of God, were men who had a perfect heart. A perfect heart. If you don't have a perfect heart, a heart bent on doing his will. A heart bent on doing his will. If you don't have such a heart, your actions will not please God, even when you think they are right in your own eyes. Their actions are right in your eyes, but they don't please God. But once your heart is geared towards doing his command, you find that he helps you go in the directions where you take steps that please him. Joseph for you. He refused, Joseph refused to sleep with a master's wife. He tells the woman, how can I commit such a sin against Elohim? He didn't say a sin against Potiphar, but a sin against Elohim. Who was invisible, who was silent in his pain. This man did not care that oh, God was silent in my pain. Where was God when I was sold as slave? Where was God when my mother died? Where was God when this happened to me? For that reason, I would compromise. He's saying to the woman, how can I sin against Elohim? But he was silent. A man with a perfect heart is a man who has made a decision, who has crossed the threshold of his conviction. A man who has said to himself, please God, no matter what. I will serve God no matter what. That is a man with a heart that is perfect. And even though Potiphar's wife seduced him over and over again, Joseph refused to compromise. At the point, the woman took a hold of his clothes. He left the clothes and he ran away from her. Why? A young man. A young man. What made Joseph think that way? His heart was perfect towards God. When a man's heart is perfect towards God, the man will do all he, this man will do all he can to protect his relationship with God. The same thing with you know so this heart that is perfect is reflected in a time of your pain. Look at Joseph, um, David, for example. David is running from Saul, who had made several attempts to take his life. Who had made several attempts to take his life. A time came, David had a chance to kill Saul. David had countless chance to kill Saul. One of David's men told him, hey, just one stroke and I will nail him down. 
David tells the, the soldier, no, we can't kill Saul. You can't kill the lost anointed. When David had countless time, chances to kill Saul, he did not take those chances because, you see, when your heart is perfect towards God, your heart waits for God to promote. When your heart is perfect towards God, your heart waits for God to open the door. When your heart is perfect towards God, your heart is waiting for the moment, the moment that God wants your promotion to happen. You don't make things happen. So David had countless time to kill Saul, who was pursuing him to take his life, but yet David refused to kill Saul. While once your heart is perfect towards God, it helps you, be, it helps you become careful of your actions. A man whose heart is perfect towards God does not rejoice at the fall of his enemy. And that's one thing, one thing about this issue we're dealing with here. Because sometimes when you search your own heart, you find our heart sometimes is glad when our enemy fall. When things are not going right with people, we measure our life by other people. And when we see this weakness in our life, we discover our heart is not yet perfect towards God. A man came to, to David and said, Hey, yes, they saw sword. He, he, I killed him at the, at the battle against the Philistine. And he asked this young man, I said, Who are you? He said, I'm an, Amor- I'm an, I'm an Amalekite. Amalekite. He said, Were you not afraid to have touched the lost anointed? Were you not afraid to have touched the lost anointed? You see? David did not even rejoice at the death of Saul. He didn't rejoice at the death of Saul. Why? Because if you feel Saul is your stumbling block and Saul is the one standing in your way and Saul is your enemy, he would have rejoiced and feel the, the absence of Saul meant his promotion. But David knew that Saul was not the key. He knew that if I could get my heart perfect towards God, Free from resentment and pain and anger and, you know, that sense of, oh, this person hurt me and this. And if I can get my heart free from source action and keep my heart in a way, God can see that, hey, see, Saul is hurting me, but see, I'm, 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 I, vengeance belongs to you. So if you could put, put yourself in that place, God can exalt you. So that's what David, Joseph did, the same thing Joseph did when his brothers came to him. He said, ah, Joseph became king. Prime Minister over, over, over Egypt. The brothers came and said, Hey, we sorry we sold you. We are so sorry we sold you as to slavery. In Genesis 50, verse 20. Let's look at, let's look at that verse there, that portion of scriptures. Genesis 50, verse 20. Genesis 50, 20. Are you there? You intended to harm me, but Elohim intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Before Joseph's father died, he called Joseph and told him, please, I know your brother hurts you. Don't, hurt, don't harm them. So Jacob was thinking that Joseph will in turn harm his, do them harm for what they did, they did to him. But known to Jacob, Joseph has developed a perfect heart. This heart that is perfect does not pay back evil for evil. No, it does not. Because the heart that is perfect puts God in the center of your journey in life. You know, it's a life that puts God in the center of your life's journey. So you meant this for evil, but Elohim meant it for good, for the saving of the nation. There are things we cannot rightly interpret in our life until we develop a perfect heart. Because once you have a perfect heart, you have a perfect understanding of your situation in life. But if not, you become so bitter. How can they have sold me? This 12, my brother sold me. 
They even plan to kill me. You'll be so angry at them. And then when you look at them in Egypt, you're like, yes, this is my, let me just, let me just torture them a bit. Maybe by torturing them, they will, no, so sometimes once your heart is not perfected, you still, it still has a weakness that the enemy can take a hold of. The reason why we must develop a perfect heart is to shield it from the weakness the enemy can capitalize upon. Sometimes it could be unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, grief, anger, unforgiveness. And these are things that reveal that our heart is not yet perfect towards God. Once your heart is perfected towards Elohim, such a heart sees injustice as an instrument of divine perfection. Just like what's happening, happening now in America. Black people feel we've been victimized. We want justice now. And if you look at what the white, white men did to the black, if you were there, the torture of, of slavery, you will want them to pay back what they've done to you. A young boy, a young boy had his brother killed by the by a police woman, a white police woman. While they were in court in trial, they asked the boy, "What do you have to say to this woman who killed your brother?" They said, I have one thing to say: I love her, and I pray she forgives, she repents of her sin. He leaves where he was kept, and he went and hugged the woman. If your heart is not perfected, you can't do that. A guy had his father's, a father, his father was a missionary to a, to a country where they kill people. This guy's father was there in that nation or that country. The father and mother was killed by the, they call them, what do they call them? They say, what do they call them? They killed the father and the mother. Years after he, he came back to the same place, he would have said, I'm not going to come back there since they killed my father and mother and then tagged those people evil. He came back and they won those people back to Messiah. And how did he win them? When he told them after, I am that boy whose mother and father you kill, I still love you. Do you know we reject people who hurt us? We walk away from those who hurt us. We walk away. We don't want to. Turn, we, we, don't, we don't want even. We don't want God to send us in the direction of, of the places we are hurting. See, once your heart is not perfect towards God, it will have reasons not to do the will of God. You have the reasons not to move into the things of God because God will send you in a place where you hurt the most. God will send you to the people who have hurt you the most. So, if your heart is not perfect towards God, it will have no. I, 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 I'm not going there. You shut the door. Joseph did not shut the door against his brothers. David did not shut his, the door against Saul. Who have we shut the doors against? Yeah, these same people are, are the people that God is watching your attitude towards them to decide your promotion. God is watching how David reacts to Saul. God is watching how Joseph reacts to his brothers. The reactions will reveal if his heart is perfect towards God or not. That's what we read in the, in the story of Asa, the king, King Asa. King Asa became king over Judah. And we see that in, in this man's life, the father of Asa had embraced court worship, idolatry. The mother of his father, Maka, was an idolater. When Asa became king, Asa did not follow the step of his father. He removed his grandmother as queen mother and destroyed all the altars, all the idols the grandmother has built. Asa did not have the father to look up to or the mother to look up to. 
Asa looked up to David. They are men. See, you may not have direct uh, direct mentors. Just like Asa did not have father to look up to, the grandmother was an idolater. He looked back to David. Kings who look at David to model their leadership in over Israel or Judah do well. Just like Jehoshaphat, Asa, you mentioned this man. Once a king emerged over Israel or Judah and they modeled their leadership style after David. And what is the style? Perfect heart. Perfect heart. They do well. Hallelujah. So let's conclude by, by looking at that second chronicles. Second chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15. Let's see from verse 12 to the end. Second Chronicles 15. Are we there? From verse 12 to the end. They entered into a covenant to seek Jehovah, the Elohim of their ancestors, all of their hearts and with all of their heart and soul. 13. All who, all who would not seek Jehovah, the Elohim of Israel, were to, were to be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. They took an oath to Jehovah with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpet and horn. All Judah rejoiced about the oath, because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and it was found by them. So Jehovah gave them rest on every side. Verse 16. King Asa also deposed his grandmother, Maka, from her position as queen mother because she had made an irrepulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places from Israel, Asa's heart was fully, see the word again, was fully committed to Jehovah all his life. He brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and articles that, that he and his father had dedicated. There was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. There is something about his heart that is perfect towards God. It causes war to cease around you. Asa's heart was fully committed to Jehovah all his life. And that will be our test. Your test in life will be how can you sustain that heart commitment to God all your life. And I pray that God will help us in our journey that no matter what happens, we will sustain a heart commitment to Jehovah all our lives. But I will thank you for your word this day we receive that which you have in store for us. We declare and decree that from today our hearts will be perfect towards you. We will glorify your holy name. We will live for your pleasure. That we will seek your greatness. We will walk in your plan. We will pray for a perfect heart towards you. That we will not do evil in your eyes. But we will do all things as you have commanded us to do. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's just 